Welcome to today's Medical Center Hour. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. I'm happy to welcome and see you all here this afternoon. Um, regrettably, 2017 is a year in which gun violence in the U.S. has escalated even more, beyond already distressing levels. Consider the almost daily gun deaths on the streets of Chicago or early last month, the recent Las Vegas massacre. And these incidents join an all too generous list in recent years of mass shootings and individual murders, suicides, and accidental deaths and injuries due to guns. Indeed, just yesterday, a local high school student was taken into custody for bringing a loaded firearm to school in a backpack. Our Medical Center Hour today, Preventing Gun Deaths, a Public Health Perspective, looks anew and again at the urgent problem of firearm violence as a serious threat to public health, safety, and welfare. It's a timely topic. A JAMA editorial just days after the Las Vegas shooting took the same tack. This is a public health crisis. Distinguished bioethicist Stephen Miles is making a return visit to UVA this week as a guest of the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. After a long career in academic medicine at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Miles is now Professor Emeritus of Medicine and Bioethics and the former Moss Family Endowed Chair in Bioethics at the University of Minnesota Medical School. His many honors include having served as President of the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities and having received the Society's Distinguished Service Award and just last month, its 2017 Lifetime Achievement Award. So we're happy to welcome him here and also congratulate him on those honors. Dr. Miles today will offer us a public health approach to gun violence. He'll present something of a comprehensive status report on gun deaths, used guns used in homicides and suicides. Uh, he'll cover issues of gun supply, the relevance of mental illness, race, and poverty to firearm deaths and injuries the effects of gun law reforms, and something we're especially <coughs> eager for, the prospects for better prevention of gun violence. So please join me in welcoming Steve Miles and Preventing Gun Violence. It's uh, very nice to be here in Virginia. Uh, many of you, uh, there's an interesting tie between Virginia and uh, uh, my home congressional district. Uh, Keith Ellison, who was the first Muslim elected to the U.S. Congress, uh, swore in to office using uh, Thomas Jefferson's Quran. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, of course, uh, of his many accomplishments, uh, only wanted two listed on his tombstone, uh, the separation of church and state and the founding of this university. And I think that he saw ahead uh, to the ways that those two accomplishments uh, would be related to each other. If we could uh, turn the light setting to two, thank you. And um, I don't have anything to disclose. Uh, I wrote it myself. And uh, I'd like to just talk about what a public health approach means. It takes the larger idea of taking gun mortality and, and using the tools of public health to analyze it. Now, we've done this with other products, consumer products, cars, for example. We found people, their chests being crushed, and so we added collapsible steering wheels, and we added, we added uh, airbags, and we added cages to prevent uh, the car from uh, uh, crushing people when it rolled over. And then we turned to road factors and we added uh, uh, reflective strips to roads and collapsible, uh, collapsible bridge abutments. Uh, and uh, we turned to various driver issues as well. And then what we did was we empirically studied the relationship between those public health reforms and automobile deaths. That's what a public health approach is. And that's the kind of approach I'm going to take today. I'm not going to discuss the ethics of uh, gun ownership or the constitutional issues. Now, if one looks at gun deaths in the United States, 
uh, one sees that um, uh, homicides uh, after bump here in the mid 90s are actually uh, trending downward. Suicides are staying the same. Accidents uh, have been uh, trending downwards. And much is made, of course, especially in this state of uh, school deaths. Uh, in K-12 uh, areas, um, there are extremely rare uh, individual events, uh, for example, in colleges uh, uh, are driven by uh, major uh, uh, anecdotal events. But in terms of the overall number of gun deaths uh, per year, in the order of 35,000, uh, these college uh, college events are rare. Now, you don't have to study these or retain anything out these slides, but you can get them all off my website. Uh, and I'm sure the Bioethics Center will make them available too. Curiously, public health research is hard to study uh, because um, the research is blocked. Uh, when two, in 1992, when two CDC studies looked at uh, the ways that the increased numbers of guns in homes was associated with homicide and suicide. Uh, there was the NRA had lobbied Congress to instruct the CDC that none of its funds could be used to study uh, or advocate, uh, promote uh, gun control. And so gun research at the CDC then dropped by 96 percent. Prior to that, of course, the Consumer Product Safety Commission had been totally barred from studying uh, uh, gun hazards as a consumer product. National Institute of Alcohol Abuse um, and Alco of, uh, Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism uh, published a study in the American Journal of Public Health showing that uh, a person uh, who was carrying a gun actually had an increased risk of being assaulted in the course of a crime. That is, the gun was not protective. Uh, and uh, the response was to extend the CDC research ban to cover all of the NIH-related institutions. Uh, and then finally, uh, in 2013, uh, the NRA extended that ban further to cover uh, statistical collections by the Bureau of Alcohol, uh, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Uh, and it also covered any analysis of their data. And uh, uh, after the uh, Sandy Hook uh, murders, the um, House blocked uh, more money, even a paltry $10 million, for studying gun violence research. So this is a pretty uh, difficult area to do research, and for, uh, fortunately, private entities are now stepping into the breach. And as the as the uh, NRA describes it, their concern is not with legitimate medical science. They just don't like the idea that gun ownership is a disease that needs to be eradicated. And gun mortality, uh, mortality is the issue. The ar argument is not that a gun like a germ is any more the uh, germ than an automobile. Curiously, internet porn uh, is regarded as a public health crisis in the GOP platform until 2016. Now, I'd like to start with this drawing because I think it's just fascinating to me. Uh, what you see here is firearm, household firearm ownership and firearm deaths. And what you see here is basically the number of houses that own, or percentage of houses that have guns is associated with a linear relationship uh, with firearm deaths. I don't see Virginia in there, but oh, it's, it's up there on the line of Texas. Where is it? It's up near Texas, right near the edge of the circle. Oh, okay, I'll take your word for it. Somewhere in here. And we, so it's an odd thing because one would have to presume somehow that uh, the sociopaths, homicidal maniacs, and suicidal people cluster in these states with high guns and that this is a particular psychological pattern of the people who live in Virginia, although I would imagine that most Virginians I've met seem pretty much like the people I know in other states. New Jersey, interestingly enough, is down low. I, that kind of has always intrigued me. I mean, maybe it's because they use concrete boots. Now, 
If you look at gun deaths, whenever you see the term gun violence in the newspaper, it's usually a code word for homicide. But here you can see that about two thirds of gun deaths are suicides, and only one third are homicides. Uh, and then the accidents are a tiny, tiny sliver. And this number is totally wrong uh, because of uh, hospital coding. And so what I want to do today is I want to take the gun suicides, which are 60% set of all deaths, uh, so call that 20,000, which is about half all, all suicides. And let's start by just looking at those, because I think that's, since that's the majority of gun violence just in the United States, I think it's an appropriate place to start. Now, one of the things that's so fascinating about this is that if you just take suicides and you do the same graph that you saw earlier, what you see is that the rate of suicide is directly proportional to gun ownership. Now, some people argue, well, if you take away the guns, what will happen is that people will just commit suicide by other means. So, let's take a look and see if that's true. Well, it turns out is here's gun ownership, gun ownership, and here is the firearm suicide rate, and you see it's linear. But if it was true that you got, that if you took away the guns, that the gun suicide rate, or that the suicide rate would go up by other means, you'd get something like this, and you don't get it. What is that happens is that the suicide rate is basically flat in these states. There's very little substitution. If I take away your gun, you don't go and hang yourself or do a drug overdose. And this is metro area suicides. And again, you see gun ownership here. And you see the total suicide rate is proportional to gun ownership. And here are the non-gun suicides here and the firearm suicides here, essentially you don't see a substitution people driving off to kill themselves by other means if they're deprived of guns. If you take a look at gun suicides and uh, guys, um, guys shoot themselves a lot. Um, women tend to be mm, either more creative or less likely to use guns. Um, they use more diverse means uh, including uh, drugs. But overall, access to a firearm increases the risk of suicide by a little bit more than threefold. Uh, but when there's a gun in the house, a woman's risk of gun suicide, uh, a woman's risk of suicide generally increases by fivefold. That is, women who don't have guns in the house are less likely, uh, much less likely, to commit suicide. Now, of course, a lot of people say, well, suicide is a mental health disorder, it's a depression, you know, and so forth, although ironically, uh, the people who make that argument are not particularly noted for being in favor of increasing mental health entitlements. In fact, uh, mental health care entitlements, uh, in fact, they tend the other way. But one can go and actually look at the question of, first off, is gun ownership uh, in a house uh, is associated with anxiety and mood disorders. That is, is the reason for um, is the reason for high rates of suicide in gun owning houses is because these people have a longer track record of uh, going and seeing counselors and so forth, or domestic violence or whatever. And you you don't find that. Um, but what is so very fascinating is that people who have made a suicide uh, attempt in the past year are much more likely to get rid of their guns because they're afraid of their impulses. And so they don't want a gun in the household. Now this is a fascinating graph here that looks at the question of the suicide risk relative to months after purchase of a handgun. 
And if you look here, what you see is in that first month after purchasing a handgun, there's a tremendous risk of suicide, which takes almost a year to go to uh, back down to baseline. Now, in a recent study that came out just uh, uh, this past month, in October, if you add a background check or delaying gun pickup by as little as two to seven days, the risk of suicide drops anywhere from um, around 11%, which is an astonishing public health intervention. Just interrupting the delivery by a very short period up to a week, you get a tremendous decrease in the number of people dying of suicide. Kids are a particular issue. And kids act, again, on access and access. Most kids' suicides are at home. Handguns are used in most, most of them. Movies have taught children to commit suicide uh, by sticking the gun in their mouth. And so these events are incredibly uh, lethal, unlike trying to use drugs to commit suicide. Again, kids committing suicide do not have more suicidal risk factors. That is, they've not been seen by a counselor for suicidal uh, treatment. They're not more likely to have been on antidepressants and so forth. But rather, it's something about putting the gun into the environment increases the lethality of the suicidal impulse in kids. Now there's another way to look at this, and that is to look at it in terms of secular trends in gun ownership. And here what you see is this is the percentage of homes with guns in the gray bars, okay? And these are the firearm suicides going down, more or less in proportion to the houses with suicide or with guns. And you'll notice that the not, again, as we saw in the earlier slides, that the, um, that the non firearm suicides have stayed absolutely straight. So that roughly every 10% decline in the percentage of homes with kids and guns is associated with an 8.3% drop in child firearm suicide. And again, women's suicides are increased. Now you can take the largest possible secular uh, data and you can look at international studies and these again are the, uh, using a different metric, uh, gun prevalence in the population. And here what we have are suicide rates and you can see that more or less the prevalence of guns is associated with the international uh, suicide risks as well, although this is not broken down into gun and non-gun suicides, but it's fair you can understand what the extrapolation will be from the preceding slides. So overall, with regard to suicide, we come to a rather, uh, you know, straightforward or amazing conclusion. First, the you know, factual conclusion that Suicides are two-thirds of all gun deaths. So when you talk about gun violence, you're talking about suicide number one. But the ri biggest risk factor for suicide is having a gun in a house. And that the availability of access to a gun increases the lethality of suicide. So you wind up with something kind of like this. All of us, or many of us, are subject to having suicidal thoughts. A relationship breaks up. We lose a job. We have some death of a person close to us. We don't pass a course. And out of the isolation in that, and out of the impulsiveness in that, the nearby access to a gun increases the lethality of that impulse. The, the impulse to kill oneself and the access is really the correlate of gun suicides, not antecedent major mental illnesses. So let's turn to look at the homicide data. 
our sites, about a third of all gun deaths. Now, let's go look at that state graph again. And what you see here is this is the percentage of the state population in houses with firearms. And here you see homicide rates, firearm homicide rates, associated with that, again, in a completely linear fashion. So would one suppose that the homicidal maniacs, the criminal elements, are concentrated in these states with high numbers of guns? It's an interesting hypothesis, I suppose, one could say that. New Jersey, anyway, I hate to pick on New Jersey. I'm going to stop doing that. Um, guns basically are a preferential mean of homicide in the United States. About 70% of all homicides are committed by guns, mostly handguns. Now, this next study is an amazing study. Uh, Annals of Internal Medicine, it's a meta-analysis, a gigantic meta-analysis, uh, and also there's this American Journal of Public Health study, which is uh, another meta-analysis. And what they did was they took and looked at homicide rates, and they controlled for violent crime rates in the neighborhood. They controlled for nonviolent crime rates in the neighborhood, because burglars, you know, they're homicidal. They controlled for incarceration rates, that is, criminal elements in the zip codes. They controlled for income inequality, and they controlled for race. And they found that all that washed out. And what they found was that for every 0.9%, every 1% increase in gun ownership, there was basically a one-for-one one increase in gun homicide rates. The Annals of Internal Medicine study found that homicides increased by doubling simply by acts in proportion to access to a gun. That, this data looks very much like the data on that preceding slide here because this data makes sense in relationship to this slide being driven by the number of guns. Now, let's take infant murder. Gun owners are eight times as likely to threaten their partner with a gun than non-gun owners. That seems obvious. I mean, they have a gun. They threaten to shoot them. They threaten to shoot the dog or the cat. They clean and load the, the gun during an argument, or they shoot a gun during the argument. But in terms of killing people, when somebody is assaulted with a gun, they're 12 times as likely to die. So if my wife comes after me with my French rolling pin, I'm likely to wind up in the hospital because it's heavy and solid but I'm not going to die. But if she points a gun at me, I'm in serious trouble. And so if there's a gun in the house and it's aimed at a person, you get a death. Now, let's take a look at this at the largest level. This is the international studies. These are gun homicides, gun ownership. And again, what one sees is that the United States is an outlier. Houses with guns and gun homicides. But, you know, people always talk about gun homicides in Guatemala or something, you know, which is an invalid comparison. So here is the data that just covers high-income OECD countries, Canada, Luxembourg, Scandinavian countries and so forth. And what you see here is that in the very wealthy countries, the United States stands alone in homicide rates, even across the end, uh, across the high-income countries. 
There's something special about the United States, but what's special is the number of guns. And so you reach an amazing conclusion, at least one that surprised me. The homicide rate is highly associated with the prevalence of guns, especially for domestic violence. In other words, there are homicidal impulses that people have, but if they have a gun, it's likely to be acted on. So you have stupid events. Like in Florida, that guy shooting the kid in the theater who was using his cell phone while he was buying popcorn. Okay? Stupid stuff like that. Won't happen, or did, wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been a gun. The gun, it turns out, the gun makes the impulse lethal. Now look at accidents. This is a tr very small number of people. Fatal gun accidents are 1% of, of all lethal home accidents. Poisoning, falling, burns. Okay? And part of the reason for that is that a gun accident is, the gun is not aimed. It drops. Okay? It discharges accidentally, but it's not aimed at somebody. And so it's more likely to be wounding. And it's very hard to study because the number of accidental lethal shootings is so small. But what you can do is you can take the four states with the fewest guns and the four states with the most guns, and you can look at accidental lethal injuries, and what you see is that they're eight times as common in the states with the most guns. And that adults with a gun in the home have a fourfold higher risk of dying of an accidental now, it's not a matter of training. It's simply a matter of the gun. Kids. Kid deaths, the little yellow dots scattered across this thing. Again, very hard to study because there's so few of them. They make the front page of the paper all the time. Now, what I did for this slide was I took the data and I indexed it for the um, high and low gun states. The high gun states were these five, low gun states were these five. This is the index rates taking the low gun states. And what you see here is that in the high states versus the low states, there's a three and a th or three, 3.3 times as more or as many homicides as in the low gun states, kid homicides. There's almost seven times as many kid suicides, and there are 16.3 times as many gun accidents. Kids, unfortunately, learn from television how to point a gun, and then it goes off. Everybody knows that the United States has the highest rate of kid deaths, higher, 11 times higher than the combined rates of 22 other high-income states. And so we come to the same bottom line that we came to for homicide and suicide. Guns in the home are the most powerful predictor of lethal gun accidents, suicides, and homicides of children. Now the NRA makes the claim all the time that the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. This, by the way, is a cockapoo, which is the world's rarest bird, so I figured I'd use it as a rare avis. Um, now they cite a study by Pleck, which is a piece of garbage, who claims that there are 2.5 million defensive gun use in the United States a year. If you look at the Bureau of Justice data, 
you see that uh, fewer than 100 persons a year disrupt a crime. Um, and then uh, several, a few more get people to scare somebody off. But I think the Cato Institute gets a prize for this one. The Cato Institute decided it was going to study a decade's worth of defensive gun uses. They stopped after eight years. And what they did was they pulled all the media reports off of Lexus and Nexus. And of course, any time there's a defensive gun use, it gets reported in multiple media, so you get this big echo effect. So they tossed out the duplicates. And they found over eight years total that there were 277 reports, roughly 30 or so a year, where an intended victim disarmed a criminal. 25 armed uh, rape attack victims got the upper hand, say, uh, three a year. About eight carjack victims prevailed. Now, that's a long way from 2.25 million. But let's take a look at some actual studies. Uh, these uh, is self-defense of gun use. And uh, this studied 127 personal conduct crimes out of 14,000 where the intended victim had a gun. And you'll notice that there was no difference in the injury rate to the victim. Where there was an attempt to have a robbery, uh, the ones with the guns uh, were somewhat more likely to uh, not lose property, 56 versus, say, 40 percent. Um, but is it worth it? Well, the next slide tells us whether that's worth it. This is a study, American Journal of Public Health. People carrying a gun were four and a half times more likely to be a shot in an assault than those who weren't carrying. So if you're carrying a gun for protection and you're assaulted, you're four and a half times more likely to be shot. Now what's so weird about this paper is that if you see that you're about to be assaulted, so you begin to take protective action, say unholster your gun, you're five and a half times likely to be injured on a baseline than somebody who's not carrying. So let's go from there to look at concealed carry laws. Now I honestly have never heard of bra holsters before I made this talk. It seems to me the idea of carrying a gun pointed at your left ventricle is a bad idea. <laughs> but, uh, and even worse than pointing it at one's genitalia, but anyway, um, does the Arizona uh, pass a law that allows persons, to, adults, to carry concealed weapons? They passed it in 2010. Naturally, the prevalence of guns went up, and the homicide rate went up 27%, exactly as the data would suggest happened. Okay, more guns on the street, more homicidal the homicidal impulses become more lethal, you have the events. Now, how many people are packing? Well, it kind of depends on the laws. If the state has a shall issue a permit, um, it's higher than if it's a may issue, uh, may issue a permit, but roughly nine million adults are packing. But let's look at this. In the shall issue states where there is no authority to not issue a permit, okay, they have a six and a half times higher homicide rate. Um, and those are firearm homicides. And so that having a shall issue state actually is also associated with an increased increased death rate. It gets worse, though. 
These are concealed carry deaths. All of the people on this slide had permits for concealed carry. And this is a tabulation, a partial tabulation of the deaths. 223 suicides. 442 homicides, of which 17 were police. Murder suicides were 48. Now these people are compiling anecdotes. These aren't rates, okay? 21 lethal accidents. 12 cases of legal self-defense, which is why these people are doing concealed carry in the first place. One can ask the question of whether this 750 deaths, murder suicides get counted, so they don't get counted twice. You can ask yourself whether this is worth this for this conviction rate and this number of police dying. The bottom line for carrying guns for self-protection is that an armed citizenry is not protected from, from, from criminal injury and that concealed carry basically increases the community homicide rate by flooding the, the community with higher guns that are misused on homicidal impulses. So let's go to the next question. Do gun control laws work? If you do buyer background checks, your relative risk drops is 40%. If you do ammunition background checks, that is, if I go buy ammunition and I have to get a background check for buying ammunition, it, relative risk drops further. If I have to have identification when I purchase a firearm, it drops further. If one were to have a national implementation of this, the firearm mortality, suicides and homicides, would be cut in half, that is by 15,000 deaths. If you add, if you have handgun purchase waiting periods, which was not available to this previous study, you'd have a 17% reduction in gun homicides and a 11 to 17% reduction in gun suicides. I'm not going to talk so much about the doctor's office. American Academy uh, data is uh, well known. I'm just going to say this. A lot of times what we try and do is we say, well, I want to ask about kids having access to guns at home because of adolescent suicide. I suggest to you it's a worthless approach because adolescents have homicidal impulses and it's the presence of the gun, not trying to predict the psychology of the kid that is the problem. And so it's not worthwhile instead the guns have to be locked in a way that the kid does not have access to the keys, the combinations, and can't break into a safe. Um, Minnesota data, you know, we get data in Minnesota looks like this, and we see the number of homicides is, is um, in blacks is very high relative to their tiny percent of the population. And so we tend to define homicide as a black problem or gun violence as a black problem. It's just wrong. This is the total number of gun victims in Minnesota. And you can see that it's suicide by whites that is the dominant expression of gun violence in the state. And that one more, instead of focusing on so-called problem populations like inner city slums, one were to focus on gun access, one would carve both the homicide and suicide rates. To take Virginia, um, what you see here in Virginia, you see that your suicide rate 
is steadily climbing, okay? Uh, and your homicide rate uh, is declining. But when you look at gun violence in Virginia, what you see is, as in the case of Minnesota, gun suicides far outnumber gun homicides in Virginia. They're the, they are a white problem. Gun violence and homicides is a big problem in the black community, and we must grieve all these deaths equally. But to grieve all of them equally suggests that we should address the common STEM issue, which is the prevalence of guns, rather than trying to separate ourselves, white and black, we should focus on the fact that all of these are tragedies, but they're tragedies caused by access and numbers of guns. Here's the homicide and suicide data nationally. And that means I get to go for questions and I will be happy to do so. After I turn up my hearing aid, which I discovered made me talk softer into the microphone so that you couldn't hear me. And so now I've turned it so I can hear you and you could have heard me. So we have a generous amount of time for discussion. We're open to hear your comments and questions. Um, again, to consider this as a, a current issue and one with, with some significant history as well. Um, I would ask you when you ask your question or offer a comment, please do identify yourself and please wait for a mic to be brought to you so that uh, your comment goes on the recording. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Peter Chapin, I'm a resident of Alma. Um Does this gender mix of this audience mean anything? The, the gender mix of this audience? Largely women. Yeah. Are there any implications here that women care a lot more about this issue than men do? Which wouldn't surprise me. Well, uh, judging from who dies, I suppose, um, um, no. I don't, actually, I don't think so. I'm not going to try and genderize this problem. I, I think suicide is, a, is something guys do. Um, the homicides. Uh, generally are done by guys, and women tend to be the victims of the gun violence. But on the other hand, in terms of who grieves, um, it's mothers and fathers who grieve when their kids die, and it's uh, husbands and wives who grieve when their kids die, and um, I, I think generally that all the talks I do on public policy issues, whether it's access to health care, um, international affairs, um, torture, all of them, the audiences are disproportionately women, and I think it's a message for the guys to get with the program and pay attention to what's going on in the world. I have a question right here. Yeah. Um, I'm a retired physician and I practice psychiatry <coughs> excuse me, about 30 years. And I, my, the way I practiced psychiatry was always to get a very full history. I really never heard much about guns. Almost never. I, I can't think of an instance. Sometimes people do kill themselves with guns, but they also do things like run into trees with cars and a lot of other things. Guns are convenient for a lot of things, uh, one of which is uh, self-defense. Uh, those of us that still believe in the Constitution, we, we believe in the First Amendment and the, the Second Amendment, and we came up with these amendments because they were very relevant, and they're still relevant. In fact, I think they're more relevant now than they were back in the day that they, they were written. Uh, there's many more people in the world, there's much more danger, a lot more violence, and the United States uh, uh, stands out for a number of reasons, one of which is our liberty and uh, freedom of speech. 
but also the, the right to defend ourselves, defend ourselves, our families, our communities, and our country. And we rely on heavily on the police, and we rely on the Army and the Navy and the Air Force and the Marine Corps, but they can't always be there. And in the real world, when things go sour, as they will, and they are, we're seeing it around our country as well as other parts of the world. One needs to have the right to defend oneself in one's own neighborhood. Um, I did hear a lot in my practice about addiction. I heard a lot about sexual abuse. And I heard a great deal about addiction plus sexual abuse. And that was very damaging. I didn't hear about chainsaws, axes, knives, hammers, rocks, or anything like that. So, you know, I, I, I think we have to be careful with guns like grip. I have a chainsaw, and I have a hammer, and I have all the rest of those tools that I use regularly in my yard. And I have to be careful with them that I don't do any harm to myself or anybody else. The same with, uh, with uh, rifles and pistols. So I think the attack on the uh, First Amendment is displaced. Mm. And I think we need to rethink that. I'm, I'm sad that it's happening. Yeah. Because uh, when we have these uh, attacks like we had in New York, it's nice to have people around immediately that may be carrying a uh, uh, concealed carry. I wanted to correct something you said. Uh, the studies I've been reading recently uh, is that people that are, have concealed carry permits are much less likely to commit crimes. And also, people cannot get a concealed carry permit if they have uh, felony, felony records, um, any kind of uh, a, a wife or husband abuse. So it's not just that they're given to everybody. It's okay. not like that. Me, You're okay. mistaken about that. That's a do complex we, question. Do we have some, yes, it, it is. Apart. And we need to have some time for additional um, questions. Go ahead, right please. Yeah. My point here is simply to promote the data. My point here is to promote the data. The, as you know, there's a movement, let's call it anti-science, which wants to pretend that we're not having global warming, we're not, uh, or that uh, guns work for protection or something like that. This is the data we have. Uh, I'm happy, if you want to email me the data that you have on concealed carry, I'll put it in the next issue of the talk, because I've looked at the data, I think this is the fairest data that I can find. The point here is not to criticize the Second Amendment. The point is to contextualize it in terms of real data. The data does not show that concealed carry works as a protection. Uh, and that's simply the fact. The question of what we do with the Constitution or laws is another thing. Now, states vary a great deal in terms of whether or not a person can carry a gun after a felony conviction for domestic violence. Virginia may have one law, Missouri may have another. There is no federal law in that matter. And so the statement that a person who does a felony assault on a spouse can't buy a gun is factually incorrect. So uh, I guess what I would suggest you do is go to my website, take a look at these slides, see where you find the errors, send me a note, and I promise you that I will revise the next edition of this as I'm always updating. That's why I put, that's why I put my sources on every slide. One of the worst situations... I, I gotta go to somebody else. Sir, One of the worst this. situations of first Virginia is to have somebody invading your home or neighborhood and not be able to defend yourself. Yeah, I gotta go to somebody else. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Penny, I'm a registered nurse here. I worked on a psych ward here for about a year. Um, we saw all kinds of homicides and suicides lately. Uh, I probably shouldn't mention that. Maybe I'll lose my job. Um, I wanted to make two points. The first slide you put up there, to me, is the end of the story, the NRA. Um, Terry Gross had an excellent uh, hour on NPR about a year ago, a man that wrote a book, maybe used some of the statistics 
studies that you cited or vice versa. I can't quote them. Um, I'm in a constant state of trauma. Just listening to the news, I try not to listen anymore. In the last year, it's just overwhelming. But the point was, this was such an excellent um, hour um, of fresh air with Terry Gross. The author cited, I mean, the NRA is such a powerful lobby. They've gone to every state, and now every state has laws on the books for concealed carry or something similar. I mean, that's the difference in the last couple of years. Every state, everybody can get a gun legally or illegally, and that is shown in all of your slides. Um, well, there are other suicides, there are other, are other homicides, but um, it's just uh, everything around us is traumatizing. And the guns, I mean, I, I want all those, I want free, freedom of speech, and I want, um, anyways. My, my, I'm not, the NRA, I think, gets, to my mind, was not responsible for the deaths. They're responsible for the inculcation of the anti-science, okay? And that is for the myths that they have put into the public policy process. It's the myths, as an academic, that are my enemy, okay? That is, my job as an academic is simply to distill the facts that I can find from the best science that I can find. That's my job. My job is not to tackle the NRA, but to tackle anti-science. So if it's anti-science in the form of vaccines cause autism, if it's anti-science in the form of global warming and coastal uh, and seawater elevations are not tearing apart the coast of Virginia, those are the issues uh, and not uh, the NRA itself. And so I think that we have enormous numbers of myths about guns that need to be dispelled, and that's what a university is for. Oh, hi, I'm Piper Shiflett. I'm an undergraduate um, global health student here, and thank you for speaking with us today. Um, I was just wondering on the matter of suicide towards the beginning of your um, talk, you were talking about how um, Removing guns from homes um, does not correlate with an increased rate of suicide um, by other means. And I was just wondering if there is data on um, numbers of attempted suicides in homes where guns are present and where guns are not. Is it simply that um, attempted suicide by gun is just much more lethal um, than other forms of attempted suicide? Is that yeah, the, the issue is that an attempted suicide with a gun carries a lethality rate of uh, between 80 and 90 percent. Um, attempted suicide by other means carries a lethality that's anywhere to, from 20 to uh, uh, 50 percent. And so it's lethality that's the real issue. Hi there, um, I'm Monet. And I'm a first year medical student here. Um, I'm deeply troubled by the, the divide between a lot of things right now in our country, but people who care about guns and care about the Second Amendment and people who seemingly want to get rid of them for a lot of the reasons that we just discussed. And I'm wondering if there's some sort of compromise that you envision that could both reduce the number of gun-related deaths without making people such as this gentleman feel that their rights are being encroached upon. Yeah. And I'll mention that I'm someone who's very concerned with these issues I'm also someone with a boyfriend who owns a gun and is a hunter. And we have these really complex conversations about this, and it's hard to find something that seems reasonable. Yeah, I think there are compromises that can be made without impinging on the Second Amendment at all. Number one, I don't think that the debate, um, I think that the, the media rushes to make the debate focus on false issues, like, for example, oh, um, these devices that turn uh, rifles into automatic rifles, uh, or even assault rifles. Assault rifles are just not a significant part of, of gun deaths in the United States. The issue is primarily handguns. Um, ball purchases help, okay? Registration helps. Um, the issues of requiring gun uh, dealerships to report thefts help. None of those impinge on the Second Amendment. 
putting in a mandatory waiting period to deliver a gun helps. Preventing felons who've committed violent crimes from getting a gun. If we prohibit them from voting, which is certainly a, a co fundamental constitutional right, we should say that a person who's committed violent crimes against another human uh, person should be prohibited from owning a gun for at least as long as the period of time that they are prohibited from voting since we've decided that their constitutional rights are to be abrogated. All of these things can be done without touching the core of the Second Amendment. But uh, on the other hand, I think that those people should avoid fads in gun control and say the issue is big clip assault rifles, which have nothing to do with the overall problem. I have a, a question as well. In keeping with the public health approach, I know um, uh, in, certainly in the practice of pediatrics and, and in other areas of primary care, um, it's often good to, to know a little bit more about the environment in which the patient lives um, and whether there would be guns or not. And it's my understanding that at least in Florida, physicians are now not allowed to no. ask or has that been changed? The state tried to prevent physicians from asking that, and that was thrown out as an infringement on, on uh, uh, free speech on the part of physicians. <coughs> a physician can ask okay. whether or not a patient or patient's family has a gun. Do you have any sense of how frequently questions like that are actually they're, asked? They're rare, and I think they're misdirected for reasons that I spoke about because they tend to focus, they tend to seek that question more often in cases of mental illness on the part of, of adolescents than seeking it with regard to kids generally. Yes, we do. Okay, we have a question right here. Yeah. Hi, my name is. Hi, my name is Rudy. I'm an undergraduate public health major. Um, and I was wondering a lot of what we've learned about in our classes is how sort of education, educating, you know, the population about the risks of certain, you know, diseases or, you know, things like gun violence can have a large impact on how people change their behavior. How, how, would, how would you suggest that we best sort of disseminate this kind of information to, like, really penetrate the mainstream? I'm disseminating it right now. <laughs> I think, I think uh, and you all are listening, so I hope it's getting across. I, I think we're seeing a substantial reduction in the number of households with guns in the United States. Okay, that is, that's steadily dropping. Uh, or we're, we're seeing in inner city homicides, uh, some of which are intentional and some not, a problem of uh, shoot and spray from uh, very large clips, which has become a bit of an issue for the inner city homicides. But I think that, I think frankly, that um, if we were to put in the methods of uh, uh, gun laws that I've spoken of with regard to waiting periods, background checks, bans on violent felons, um, reporting gun thefts, uh, bans on bulk purchasing, we could do this all within a, uh, all within the context of the Second Amendment without hurting the ability of citizens to buy guns in a way that would greatly, um, greatly reduce, uh, perhaps reduce by uh, half the number of gun deaths in the United States, bring us more into line with other nations. I think we've come to the end of our hour. Before we thank Steve Miles, I'll invite you to join us next week for a program entitled, How Can I Meet You? Knowing Each Other in Poetry and Medicine. Our speaker is poet Mark Doty, who is, this semester is a Capnick Distinguished Writer in Residence in the English Department here, and our program is co-sponsored by the Creative Writing Program. Please join me in thanking Steve Miles for a great